Okay, good morning, Justice Reform Partnership. My name is Coco Pappy. I'm the Director of Public Policy and Communications at Deep Center based in Savannah, Georgia. We have an amazing group with us here today. Um, we will be interviewing um, Representative Mary Margaret Oliver and Representative Mandy Ballinger um, as by Deep Youth and Apollo Johnson, one of our life navigators. So I am going to turn it over to the magnificent Ramel McBride, who will be leading us through this conversation on Raise the Age. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Ramel. I got a question uh, from Ms. Chair Ballinger. Um, hey, how you doing today, too? Um, Good, how are you? Uh, my question is, how would you define raise the age? Uh, well, raise the age will uh, allow for 17 year olds to be adjudicated in juvenile court, meaning that their court case will actually be handled in juvenile court. Um, so that that right now, Georgia is one of three states left. Um, of the 50 that still adjudicate 17 year olds in state or superior court. So, you know, if you're 17 and you get arrested, you go to court just like his, is the same as if you were 35. Uh, you go to the same courthouse, you go to this, you have the same judges, you have, you have everything the same as you would a, as an adult. Right. And raise the age would allow for 17 year olds to, to go to juvenile court where they belong. Chair Bellinger, um, uh -huh. many other states treat their 17 year olds like Georgia does. Many other states treat 17 year olds as what? As juveniles. Yes, that is correct. Like I said, 47 other states um, adjudicate their 17 year olds in juvenile court where they belong. Georgia's one of the antiquated three that are still out there adjudicating their 17 year olds in state or superior court. Uh, just to put it in contrast, Alabama changed that provision in their law in 1978. Um, so that was well over 43 or 44 years ago. Um, so, uh, you know, it's, it's long past due. A lot of people have concerns about money and uh, various uh, hesitations in, in enacting such a, you know, it is a big change in policy for the state. Um, but I am, I'm hopeful that we'll be able to get it across the line this time. We're certainly working very hard and with the, I hope that the, uh, a lot of the funds that we have right now from uh, the COVID recovery funds and we just seem to have kind of a lot of a lot of money kind of floating around state revenues are up everything is good right now we're not having to make any cuts so i'm i fingers crossed i'm i'm optimistic um about being able to to change that this year uh, how are you doing uh chair ballinger uh, my name okay. is apollo johnson and i'm a life navigator with deep center and i had a question i wanted to ask sure what do you think the long-term financial ramifications are for the state of Georgia when we uh, adjudicate 17 year olds with adults? Um, oh, there are multiple long-term ramifications of adjudicating 17 year olds in state or superior court. Uh, the first being the juveniles are not being treated as they should. They're not being treated as juveniles. Um, these are kids that are still in high school. They're still living with their parents. They can't even sit on the jury that might convict them. Um, they are, they should be adjudicated in juvenile court and because they don't get the expertise that they would get, um, of people who are accustomed to dealing with juveniles, they're, uh, you know, juvenile judges, juvenile prosecutors, uh, juvenile court, uh, attorneys that represent juveniles, all of those folks are very, uh, you know, they have a very differentiated skill set. Um, they're very used to dealing with juveniles and kind of recognizing some of the issues that they may be facing. Um, so they're able to get much more uh, services that are very much more geared towards them and not geared towards a 40 year old guy with, with two kids, um, you know, living in an apartment in Atlanta. They, they are two different things. They're two different worlds. Um, and being able to get that age specific uh, adjudication of their case will allow them uh, to move forward. Um, it will take into consideration the repercussions of a conviction on their life. So they may get, uh, they may be able to get a pretrial diversion or something like that. Um, and as a juvenile, the, the records are not open to uh, public. They're, they're not open records. So um, they are considered uh, closed. So they wouldn't have that 
uh, arrest stain on their record. So, Mayor Margaret, I'm sure you can think of uh, some other benefits uh, and, you know, kind of the downside of having 17-year-olds uh, go to our state or superior courts. Good afternoon. Thank you for the invitation. Having a lifetime mug shot, shot of your face, of a 17-year-old face, when you're trying to get a job at age 40 is a problem. It's a lifetime mug shot. If you treat every seven, every one of the 6,000 or so children, 17 year old minors who are arrested every year as an adult criminal, that means they have a permanent criminal record. And I think that's one of the primary reasons that we've moved away we being the United States of America, 47 states, moved away from prosecuting children as adults. We know that, I heard the Chamber of Commerce guy last week say that 38% of Georgians have some form of criminal record. That doesn't mean they've been convicted, but they mean they've been arrested. Um, for the 6,000 people that are arrested when they're 17, they have a whole lifetime to deal with that. And the employers of the world, like the Georgia Chamber of Commerce, have realized that given our workforce issues, we really cannot use that one arrest, may have been, may have been their only arrest in their life at age 17, to prohibit them from getting a job their entire life. There's so many reasons that we need to do away with this 17 year old treated as adult that the, the implications of how it's carried out for, for too many Georgians is just very disastrous and does not, does not serve the interest of public safety. Hey, Representative Oliver, how you doing? I'm good, thank you. Um, what is the difference between superior court and juvenile court? For example, what can a 17 year old who's charged as an adult accept the experience versus a 16 year old who's charged the same offense? They're totally different treatment programs, uh, security programs, and uh, life term of of residence as a juvenile in a juvenile facility. The Department of Juvenile Justice that houses uh, minors up to 16 is a certified school system. So if you go, have to go into one of those DJJ, Department of Juvenile Justice facilities at age 16, um, you're at least gonna be able to work on your GED in a certified school system and you'll get a normal graduation degree, not just a, a GED. So that's a big difference. Uh, for 17 year olds who are arrested and treated as adult, they, uh, whether or not, if they can't get bond, then they're in jail that uh, doesn't offer anything close to a certified school system. And then when they're sent off to jail, um, there's certainly no certified school system either. So the provision of basic education services is a huge difference. Uh, we have been very inconsistent in my long political career in the correction system for adults, but includes 17 year olds, uh, about what education services we do offer. At times, uh, some inmates are able to take college classes online, uh, but that's been very inconsistent in the juvenile Department of Juvenile Justice, there's a much more intensive look on psychiatric evaluations and opportunities for remediation and possible community-based services. So it's a pretty different model. And that's why 17-year-olds have a, a much better opportunity um, to move away from an arrest, move away from a correction and correction, move away from a conviction and be able to be employed or go to school or pick up their life. Big differences. Yeah, if uh, I can put it in a nutshell, the superior courts are, uh, the superior courts are punitive, they're to punish basically, whereas the juvenile courts are meant to be more rehabilitative. Um, and Mayor, Representative Chairman Oliver gave us some great examples of that. 
And that's based on the history of the juvenile court. You know, juvenile courts are only 100 years old in this country. And they were based on a theory that minors, not legal adults, minors, um, should have a better shot at rehabilitation at a young age to prevent uh, the kind of disasters that come from an adult criminal record, a mugshot, for instance, for life. Um, I would agree there. Uh, I'm a returned citizen and I had my first interaction with the criminal justice system at 17 years old. And I would say for the next 20 years, it was a in and out uh, kind of you get out, try to find your footing, uh, fail at that, find yourself back in for small minor matters. Um, and without the uh, source of educational or vocational training, we kind of can do condemn our fellow citizens to that turnstile. Uh, luckily, I had familiar support, uh, some community support, and I was able to earn a college degree. And I'd like to think a able to contribute now. And I'm working with Deep Center and in this particular field to make sure that uh, young people today don't have to spend 20 years trying to figure it out and uh, becoming a burden on society and the community in general. Excuse me, Chair Banjer, I have another question. Um, okay. Do we know how many kids would be affected by raising the Georgia, by, oh no, 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 affected by raising the age in Georgia? What kind of data do we have in this area? Um, it would impact about 8,000 children. Um, those are our most recent numbers um, that we have. However, sometimes it's really hard to kind of separate out all of those different uh, categories that we have. We have juveniles who uh, Mary Margaret refers to them as 440s. I knew them as seven deadlies, although they've kind of added on. And those are our most violent felonies. Um, you know, murder and uh, aggravated robbery and uh, armed robbery and uh, those sorts of offenses that are uh, any anyone 13 or over can be charged as an adult. Um, so those charges are kind of lumped in with those. We, we kind of have a hard time parsing out exactly um, how many it's going to be, but um, I have been encouraging my juvenile judges to go back and look at their files and pull their county files and look at how many kids they think it honestly will be. And I've had several come back very surprised at how low the number is. Right. Um, its impact is going to be immediate and, and very uh, rehabilitative and it's going to be a big step forward um, but the numbers are going to be kind of gradually increased um, and I do think that it's not this guy will not fall and, and it won't, won't impact as many children as we think it will but um, I, I think it will have a tremendous impact on those that, that it does touch. It's also helpful to know that the number of 17 year olds getting arrested has been reduced is, is reducing it's going down and um, it's hard to know the exact number uh, because, you know, there are 530 cities in Georgia and 159 counties. And that means that there are hundreds and hundreds of jails <laughs> that people can be in. And getting real good information about how many 17 year olds are sitting in adult jails is, is, hard, to, uh, is hard to know. But the number is going down. At the same time, the numbers going down uh, for most of the 17 year olds being arrested and most of whom are misdemeanors. We have some very high profile violent crimes committed by teenagers. Um, and this is, is disturbing, disturbing news. It may be gang related. There's a lot of people, smart people uh, who look at this carefully, who believe a, a lot of that violent activity is great gang related. So you have this dramatic examples of violent crimes by very young people. At the same time, you have a fall, falling population of actual 17 year olds who are arrested and consistent, most of them, more than half, are misdemeanors. So tracing all this information is really important to help us make good decisions. Uh, Representative Oliver. 
Do you know of many other states that treat their 17 year olds the way Georgia do? There's only uh, two others uh, right now, Wisconsin and Texas are the only states that prosecute 17 year olds as adults in Georgia. There are three states, Georgia, Wisconsin, Texas. North Carolina recently, more recently than Alabama made the transition to eliminate prosecution of minors in adult courts. So we're watching uh, a lot of the states that have made that transition to the mainstream. Um, what, what does it really cost? How does it really change the system? Uh, and how can we model this transition that I believe will come uh, hopefully this year in a way that uh, we can do it in the most cost-effective and most efficient manner. Uh, Chair Ballinger, mm -hmm. can you tell us what the status of Georgia's current age, age bill is? Uh, I think it's HB 272. What still, yes. still needs to happen for this to pass? Um, well, it didn't. It passed Senate Judiciary last year, um, but did not get called up. Um, so as a result, it went back to Senate Judiciary and there it resides. Um, so it will once again uh, have a hearing in Senate Judiciary. Um, if it passes out of Senate Judiciary, then it will move on to uh, the Rules Committee. It will need to pass out of the Rules Committee and it will need to move on to the floor of the Senate. Um, once it passes the Senate, it will have to come back over to the House for an agree. Obviously, there have been some changes to it um, as it has moved through the process. So it will once again have to come to the House for an agree. Um, and after that, then it will um, you know, be sent to the governor's office uh, for signature. Um, I, let's, I thought of something that I needed to add, and I completely forgot it. Forgot the, what it the big was. news is that the bill 272 passed the House last year. Yes. Uh, I don't think anybody voted against it. Did they? Was it a unanimous or just a handful? I don't remember. But no, it, was, it, was, it was not unanimous. Um, and, you know, it's a it's a credit to the bipartisanship of the House that that it was able to to get over to the Senate. Um, so the sheriffs are very much against it. However, we have gotten some key endorsements and key support for the group for the for the measure. Uh, the attorneys are officially the State Bar of Georgia is officially supporting it. Um, they had a Board of Governors meeting and, and they voted to officially support Raise the Age. Um, so they're a very large group. So hopefully they'll be able to, to help out with, uh, you know, some of the folks on Senate Judiciary. Um, and also the juvenile judges um, are becoming a lot more supportive of it as they realize the numbers that they're dealing with and, um, you know, kind of the, the, and the benefits that the bill will have. So we're kind of, we're getting more and more support as, as we go along. So it's, it's a process, uh, but, you know, we keep, we keep working it. We keep, um, you know, we yeah, keep going and keep efforting it. So hopefully I, as long as I'm in, I will, unless we get it passed. I will continue to work on this. I'm a bit like a terrier, you know? What can all of us as Georgians do to help raise the aid? Most of us in the General Assembly, I, and I've served in both the House and the Senate, really, you'd be surprised how seldomly we hear from constituents. There'll be some hot button issues. There'll be some things that people get excited about, things like cityhood, which is uh, always a, a, you know, a burn burner kind of issue, but most issues we don't hear from people. And I would say 90% of the people who communicate with me are lobbyists. They're not voters for me. They're people who work in the Capitol and are very attentive and do very good work. But they're not, I, I know who the lobbyists are who come to me who are constituents. I know who the people in the Capitol who are constituents. I, I want to hear from constituents. And if somebody uh, call me up, I've been an active, both Mandy and I have been active in this issue for a good while. I don't think I've heard from, I don't, I don't think I've heard from 10 people in, the, in this term that said they care about race age. And I'm, I'm, one, you know, I'm one of the people who've been talking about it for years. So never underestimate the significance of you as a voter being able to call your representative or senator and say, 
I am a constituent and I really care about this issue and I'd appreciate if you'd vote for it. Never underestimate the power of that communication, whether it's an email communication, a phone, or seeing them at a town hall. 